What's up, everybody, and welcome back to TarHeelIllustrated.com. Or, of course, if you are watching on our fast growing YouTube channel, that is Tar Heel Illustrated. I'm THL staff writer Jacob Turner, and joining me, as he always does, our very own publisher, Andrew Jones. And AJ, I think everybody, obviously, if you've clicked on the video, knows why they're watching this one. Big game in Chapel Hill this week. At least that's the rumor I'm hearing. It's number nine Duke. It's, yeah, yeah, big game. Come in, number nine Duke travels to Chapel Hill. Saturday, 6 p.m. tip-off in the Smith Center. That game will be on ESPN. Spectacle because it's Carolina Duke. Even more of a spectacle because it's Coach K's last um, game in the Smith Center and Hubert Davis's first game in the Carolina Duke rivalry as the head coach of the Tar Heels. So a lot of different storylines to hit on. College game day is going to be there beforehand. So just so many moving parts we'll talk about and, and so many reasons it's making the Carolina Duke rivalry, which is always huge even bigger. But before we dive into that, I want to give a quick, quick shout out to our podcast sponsor, Rogue Apothecary. We blasted them a lot. Really good products they have, you know, top shelf family grown hemp products. So whether it's CBD, Delta 8, tinctures, oils, gummies, whatever you're looking for, they've got all of that. AJ uses some of their stuff. We've got some other staff members who use their stuff as well. Really, really high quality products. So and you're, looking, and you're going to try it soon, right? Yep, I'm about to try it soon gonna, as well. We're going to get you a sample, and you're going to try it as well, so you can speak from uh, the first per, firsthand experience on it as well. Absolutely, absolutely. I've I've used some some CBD and some Delta Eight products in the past. I haven't been able to try Rogues yet, but I am in contact with them right now, trying to get some of their products because I do need to try it out. I mean, from what you're telling me, and some other staff members have told me, yeah. really, really high quality products. So, really looking forward to getting my hands on that stuff finally. Uh, Because I know that what they do is just really, really high quality stuff. So head on over there. Link is in the description below to their website. Make sure you also use the promo code TARHEELS10 to save. You can save big time on their stuff. So like I said, promo code TARHEELS10. Link to their website in the description below. But AJ, a lot to talk about in this one. Carolina Duke, like I already mentioned, such a big game for so many different reasons. Duke shoot, sitting at 18 and three, eight and two in ACC play. They've won seven of the last nine and won four straight. Carolina won four straight as well, sitting at 16 and six, eight and three in the ACC. Also, with Notre Dame beating Miami on Wednesday night, games become this game becomes even bigger because obviously, if Carolina can beat Duke, you're going to have a, I believe you're going to have a tie atop the ACC with a few teams in, in terms of, uh, you know, for that top spot in ACC play. So, Big game for that reason as well. A lot of storylines in this one, which I'm sure, as I can attest to and as AJ can attest to, makes it that much more fun to cover from a journalistic perspective. But, AJ, I want to look back a little bit before we look forward. For those who don't know, AJ and David did do a podcast about an hour long, really, really good stuff. We actually just put it out on Thursday morning about Carolina, looking back to their last two weeks of play, including their losses at Miami and Wake Forest and their four-game win streak heading into this game. So check that one out after this one's done. So we won't go too in-depth on that because obviously you and you and David did some a lot of talking about uh, looking back a little bit. But let, let's look back a little bit. Carolina's won four in a row, coming off a really hard-fought victory at Louisville, 90-83 in overtime. A few days in between to prepare for Duke. Um, what is your thoughts about where the Tar Heels are at right now? Because, I mean, you would think with how they played in the Smith Center, 12-0 and this season, coming off four straight wins, Carolina's got to be pretty high in confidence going into this game against the Blue Devils. Certainly a lot more than they were after Winston-Salem. Yeah. Goes without and, saying, doesn't uh, it? <laughs> you know, we may look back and look at and, and de- kind of describe Hubert's move the day after the Wake Forest game as genius. The players thought that they were going to run until they threw up. They thought they were going to have one of those, you know, no rim practices Mm -hmm. that uh, the Tom Izzo's of the world are famous for. And it didn't happen. Hubert came in and relaxed them, eased their, their stress over how they had played that week and probably some uncertainty about the direction things were going. And that was the last game that Dawson Garcia played in. So, they had to change in some respects because they didn't have him and they had just lost Anthony Harris not long before. But I think more important is the fact that Hubert came in and said, guys, there's a lot of basketball left. It's still January. You've got a lot in front of you that you can still accomplish. You lost two games by 50 points combined. 
but they still show up as L's in the column, just like a one point loss at the buzzer would have shown up. So you still control what ends up happening to you and you're a good enough team to do something about it. And I think that that eased the kids some and got them a little bit kind of, you know, on the right course. Now they had to navigate through Virginia tech and Boston college where they weren't really, you know, churning their wheels in in any kind of a smooth manner. Then they go, then they play state and they hit everything they throw up. Then they have to grit the, grit the game out at Louisville. That uh, was not all that well officiated. And they got some calls. Louisville got some calls. They got no calls. Louisville got no calls. It was a, it was one of those games that that the grittier team ended up winning and Carolina was the grittier team. They combined that with making the right plays, enough right plays. And I think that that was tremendous growth for this team. And to be perfectly honest with you, going back to went to Saturday night at Winston-Salem a couple weeks ago, when I'm talking to other media after that game and people are like, you know, God, this, this club is not going to make the NCAA tournament. They're spiraling in the wrong way. Does Hubert know what he's doing? All that kind of stuff. And and those were conversations. I I think that if you were to have scripted out the best way for this team to move forward, heading into the Duke game, I think it's played out. You don't have to be pretty all the time. I think you, you learn a lot more when you're not pretty and you win. I think you learn a lot more when you don't shoot. Well, they've shot 41% from the floor in a four game win streak. Mm -hmm. They've been forced to do other things to get wins. Now they haven't played a great collection of competition, but it doesn't matter. They're ACC teams. They were ACC games. They were a downtrodden club themselves when this stretch started and they've kind of pulled themselves through it. And they've changed in the last two weeks, part of it by force out of necessity because Garcia is not there and Harris is no longer available, but I think we've seen him get better. And because they haven't played great in any of these games, including NC state, they hit a lot of questionable shots in that game. I think they're due for a really good performance and perhaps that performance comes Saturday. Now, with that being said, Jacob, they can play really, really well and still lose to Duke. Absolutely. Cause yeah. Duke Duke at times is, is breathtakingly good. So, but you have to play really, really well to have a chance to beat Duke. So perhaps they are trending in that direction to have one of those kind of games. And I suspect it may well come Saturday evening. Yeah. I think so too. And I like what you said about that. And I think it does bode well. Like I said, that Carolina is playing in Chapel Hill 12 and 0 this season. I mean, they've just looked so comfortable in that building. And, you know, like you said, they, they've, they've won some ugly games, especially looking back to kind of Virginia Tech and Boston College not too long ago. But they've consistently won and found ways to win in the Smith Center and had some really good performances in there as well. So I think that does bode well for the Tar Heels. And when you're coming off a four game win streak, like I mentioned earlier, you should be full of confidence heading into that. Um, I want to hit on Duke a little bit. We'll obviously stick with Carolina a little bit after this. We do need to hit on the Blue Devils um, for a second. Um, Going to dive into some stats on them in particular with some individual guys, the guys that are kind of their go-to. And it obviously starts with Paolo Banchero, kind of their go-to guy, 17.8 points, 8.3 boards, leads team leads the team in both points and rebounds. He's really the guy that you got to watch out for. Really, really, really talented player. Wendell Moore, been around there for a little bit. Carolina fans obviously familiar with him. Second on the team in scoring with 14.2 points, 5.5 rebounds, excuse me, and 4.5 assists. Does lead the Blue Devils in assists. You also got Trevor Keels with 11.4 points a game. Tar Heels will remember him and Mark Williams as well, who's averaging 10 points, 7.1 boards. You got four guys right there averaging in double figures. Got well, I believe it's four guys that play over 30 minutes or average, excuse me, over 30 minutes for the Blue Devils. So, very heavy rotation of those guys seeing a lot of action, kind of similar to what we've seen with Carolina over recent weeks with their five starters getting a vast majority of the minutes in recent weeks. And it has bode well for the Tar Heels with how they played in the last two weeks in particular. So, it's Duke, number nine team in the country, only lost two games in conference play, only lost three games this season. Talented team. Always is. I mean, it's, it's, it's a really good co- team that Coach K has in his final season. Um, what stands out to you, AJ, about the Blue Devils? And I know that's probably a, a long-winded question because it's probably it's a, a lot loaded of, question. Yeah. It's a loaded what question. What in particular maybe doesn't match up well with Carolina? What are you kind of looking for from the Blue Devils going into Saturday's matchup? Well, first of all, Ben Caro is a great player. Yeah, and I remember time. watching stuff of him in high school in AAU, and I was thinking, you know, that guy, that guy can have almost a Zion like effect there. And mm-hmm. he doesn't have the same personality. He doesn't 
command the same aura that Zion did, but he could be really, really good on that level. And there's a lot of dimensions to his game. I think he's a matchup nightmare because in, the, in Carolina, at times when they when they face teams with one really, really good player, they've done pretty well. You know, Georgia Tech, NC State, there are examples of that out there. Mm-hmm. But with Duke, I mean, they could put Leakey on Bancaro. Bancaro can body him down low. Mm-hmm. He can get stuff, stuff off over him. Uh, he, he Let's say Leakey guards Bancaro and he's as a pedestrian game, scores 10 points, 12 points, and gets half of them at the line, that kind of thing. But Wendell Moore can have a big game. Yeah. You know, uh, Keels is just coming off the injuries. Not, he hasn't shot great from the perimeter, but, you know, he's a strong dude. He's got a pro body. He, he can have some uh, success against RJ or Caleb, whoever's going to guard him. I love what A.J. Griffin's been doing for them lately. Yeah, yeah big time. You have to kind of include him. He's been playing over 26 minutes a game in the last 10 or 12 games. He's averaging about 12 and a half points in that stretch, I think. You have to think of him when you think of the guys that that, that Duke uses. And, and he's had a couple 20-point games. He's kind of when he's hot, he's really hot. When he's not, he's really not. So if he's hot early Saturday, that's a great sign for Duke and a terrible sign for Carolina. I just think that they're a difficult matchup for Carolina because you have to guard one through five. Mark Williams is not posting huge numbers like people thought he would. But trust me, Mark Williams could go 20 and 15 in this he- game. He's incredibly efficient, too, shooting like 69% from the floor, too. So that's well, impressive. you have to keep him off the offensive glass. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 if you can keep him off the offensive glass, that's a, that's a you need to have a lot of little victories within the grand scheme of a game like this, and that would be a little victory for Carolina, keeping him off the glass. Because I'm not sure Carolina can slow Duke offensively. They can maybe disrupt some and limit the second chance opportunities and maybe make the degree of difficulty a little bit higher on certain plays and don't let Bancaro go for 35. I mean, he's not generally a 35 kind of guy because they have so many weapons and because Wendell Moore has improved his game so much, which is great to see the kid who came in and struggled and he's one of the best all players in the league right now. The numbers, the numbers say that, but also watching him play. But I'll tell you another thing was when they go to the bench, they get production. You know, Theo John is a guy that boy, Louisville would have loved to have him the other night. Absolutely. Yeah. He's only playing 11 minutes a game. This guy's played 2,600 minutes in his college career, had a lot of success at Marquette. He's a physical player. I could see them wanting to pound and pound and pound Armando, wear him down, wear down the Tar Heels because they can go deep. I think Joey Baker gives them solid minutes. I love the fact he's a senior and has accepted his role and he's embraced it. You know, they've got a lot of that going on there. Um, they've been – Jeremy Roach is someone who probably thought he was going to have a better year, more productive year than he has, but he's accepted a role. And he's a, he's a, just another guy that if you start pointing on that roster, how many guys in that roster that they're going to play could score 15 points Saturday night? There are a lot of dudes. Mm-hmm. And they could do it in a lot of different ways. So I think the challenge for Carolina, there are many challenges in this game. The number one thing is you got to keep Williams off the offensive glass. Number two is keep Duke off the offensive glass. Number three is be in their way. You know, if you play in front of the ball, maybe f- draw some charges, some ch- uh, offensive fouls on, on Duke, kind of disrupt a little bit like that. But they're not going to stop them from – rolling up 75 points, maybe even 80 points. I think this yeah. game is going to – if Carolina wins, Carolina's going to have to get up into the mid-80s mm-hmm. to win this game. Mm-hmm. So I think it begins on the defensive end and also on the defensive glass, which is part of being on the defensive end. That's where – Carolina cannot be bad. They, they can't be like they were against Kentucky. How many times have you seen Tennessee's offense really struggle this year? They had no issues against Carolina. I know it's a long time ago, but that stuff flared up just a couple of weeks ago, right? Mm-hmm. Miami had a lot of success. Wake had a lot of success. And Duke is significantly more talented than both, even though Miami did beat them in uh, in Cameron Indoor. Yep. So this is an enormous challenge. There are a lot of other things we can hit on yeah. looking at this game. But that's where it begins to me. If Carolina is not dialed in, if they don't have a respectable showing on that end, they have no chance to win this game. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more with that. I want to hit on depth with Carolina before we kind of dive into more of what Carolina needs to do to win the game or have a chance to win the game. On Saturday, um, you talked about Duke having the ability to roll some guys out and get in, you got some guys that are giving them some positive minutes off the bench. It, it seems to have kind of been the opposite to Carolina, especially as they dove 
deeper into ACC play. And I'm going to use a stat from the Louisville game to kind of illustrate Carolina's lack of production off the bench in recent weeks in particular. Louisville had 44 bench points. Carolina had zero. Carolina still won the game by seven in overtime. We haven't seen Hubert Davis rotate for a majority of the season. It's got even tighter in terms of Carolina's five-man rotation in recent weeks. I mean, I know in the Louisville game, I think Puff and, and Kerwin had a, played about 10 minutes apiece maybe, and I, I think McCoy got in for a minute or two. So you're really 30, seeing – a 35 se- He played 35 yeah. seconds. Yeah, rounded up to a minute, I guess, <laughs> for the yeah. heck of it, right? <laughs> yeah. Make it look better. But we've seen Carolina – and Hubert Davis in particular, choose not to go to the bench. And we can sit here and debate why that may be and, and why it might why he chooses to not go there. I know you wrote a piece recently kind of hitting on that. And, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, but what you basically said, which I think 100% agree with, is, look, guys, it is what it is. It, it's not going to change. We're, you know, in February at this point in the season, Carolina's deep in ACC play. These five guys are the guys, especially with Dawson Garcia and Anthony Harris out, those were the guys that were coming off the bench anyway. They don't have those guys right now. These are the five guys that, that Hubert's going to roll with, and that's just how it's going to be. They're going to play a ton of minutes, 30-plus minutes a game. What do you make of that? And it, yeah, it, I mean, do you – I mean, I don't expect it to change. It's who they are. Too. Jacob, yeah, it's, it's who they, they are. are at this point. That's kind of the word I'm looking for. You yeah. know, part of it has been forced because Garcia is is gone and, and may, well, may, may not come back. We don't know. Uh, yeah. I, I, don't, I, don't think, I don't think Carolina is – planning each day thinking well when we get Dawson back we can do this they're moving they're moving ahead as if they're not going to get him back they will not have Anthony Harris available so those were two guys that absolutely played and got minutes and Garcia got a lot of minutes in some games yeah, yeah. and then you had Walton and and what Puff has been able to do that would have been a nine they'd be going nine deep if that was the case and, and then you throw in McCoy in situations that would be 10 deep. And that's kind of what Roy was at this time. Most years, Mm -hmm. Uh, what they are is there are five guys that start that Hubert trusts implicitly. And then after that, I think the trust factors down. He knows, I think he doesn't think that Kerwin's going to hurt him too much. And and he kind of likes some of the spark and bounce that Puff brings to the floor. Um, I don't think there's a high trust factor with Justin McCoy right now or he would play more, especially when they need some ruggedness. I mean, Tony Bennett last year always put him in the game when they needed some ruggedness, when they needed some energy, when they needed some physicality. And he would put Puff in for Jay Huff. Mm -hmm. Or excuse me, not Puff, uh, uh, Justin Justin in for Jay Huff, and he'd play the five. Mm -hmm. And they won the regular season title in the league. Yeah. So he had a successful role that that he executed well last year. Whatever the reason is. Hubert isn't seeing it the same way this year. So I think what you see is what you get. And I do think in a way this group's gotten better because Manic getting Garcia's minutes, getting all those minutes, his chemistry with Armando was already pretty good, but it's even better now. But we're starting to see his chemistry with Caleb and RJ. Some of the assists that Caleb had to Manic the other day were in part a a byproduct, the fact they've been on the court a ton together lately. Hmm. And to your point about the bench minutes, Virginia Tech, the bench played 25 minutes. Boston College, the bench played 21. Against NC State, the third sub was Dontre Styles with six and a half minutes left in the game. Carolina had a 35-point lead with 14 minutes left in the game. And then the other night, the subs played 21 of 225 minutes because overtime, you had the extra 25 minutes. So uh, th- kind of this is who they are. And – Carolina fans got to stop worrying about it. This is who they are. They've got to learn to play 38 minutes together, mm-hmm. 37 minutes, because that's what it's going to be. Mm-hmm. And Hubert believes that that's the best way for them to win games. That's the group playing as much as they can and being as best conditioned as they can. That gives them the greatest opportunity to win games like Saturday, to go win at Clemson, to navigate through the rest of this schedule, and then in the postseason. Mm-hmm. So this is who they are. People got to stop worrying about Styles and Dunn and everybody else because this is who they are. It's not like Hubert's going to wake up tomorrow and say, "Yeah, you know, I've been really missing the boat on this Styles kid. Let me let me get him in here at the first TV timeout and give him twenty minutes tonight." Yeah, it's not happening. No, no, no. Now I I think it's possible that as Styles and Dunn improve and they have improved and they from everything to my understanding they've had a phenomenal attitude about it. I've seen them working out after games, most games. I've seen Dunn working out after every home game, getting a lot of shots in and that kind of thing. Maybe at some point here in the next few weeks, Hubert sees something in practice. You know what? I think I think Don Trez is ready. I think DeMarco is ready. 
and he adds them a little bit to the rotation. I wouldn't expect it. It's certainly possible, though. Carolina fans need to understand they're going into this game Saturday with an iron five. And anything that Puff and Kerwin can give them, and if by chance McCoy gets into the game, if they don't hurt them, that's a positive. Because your bench isn't supposed to hurt you. They don't always have to lift you up, but they can't hurt you. And um, that's what Carolina fans, how they need to view this. And they got to stop getting stressed over the bench situation. This is who they are. Mm-hmm. And some of this was forced out of their control. Yeah, the Harris absolutely. and Garcia situations are not Hubert's fault. Mm-hmm. He didn't do anything wrong in those situations. It just, they occurred. Maybe you could say he should have played some of these guys earlier to get them ready just in case something like that happened. Well, he didn't. And this is where they are right now. And I think I used this line there tonight, but as Gene Hackman said in Hoosiers, my team is on the floor. Yeah. If that's your club. You got an iron five and just better hope that they stay, that they stay fresh enough and that they don't get in foul trouble. And if that happens, they have a chance to beat everybody on their schedule. Yeah. And like you said, you've seen a lot of, you know, hindsight's 2020, you know, and I think it's a fair criticism in some ways. And I've said it all season that, you know, maybe early on in the year, Hubert could have rotated more in certain instances, but like you said, it didn't happen. It is what it is at this point. But, but here's the thing. And this is what I've been telling people. And, mm-hmm. and I gotta be careful how this comes across, but maybe those kids just aren't ready. Yeah. And that's, I that's think a, the yeah. cavern between the current starters and everybody else is here. It wasn't like that when you had Garcia, and maybe it was a little bit like this when you had Harris, because Anthony does bring a lot of attributes to the court, and he can certainly defend. Mm. Uh, not great with the ball, not great with skills, but he, but he's a lot of energy. I think Puff gives them that energy. I think gives them a little bit more skill, and he gives them more length, and you can maybe be a little bit more flexible. You know, when you have Puff at the three as opposed to Anthony Harris at the three, I think that that's more ideal given that I think there's more to what Puff can do in the course of his 10 or 12 minutes than what Harris does. So, but he's not as experienced as Harris. So Harris has an edge there with that, but you know, they had enough before, because if you look at teams, once they hit uh, February and start striding toward the NCAA tournament and rotations are tight, seven or eight's plenty. And North Carolina's had some really good teams that the 82 title team wasn't that deep. I know the game was a little different than didn't have the shot clock and all that stuff, but the 98 team wasn't that deep and and they did all right. Uh, So they had that stupid six man starting rotation. I think kind of screwed them a little bit in the end, but, <laughs> but that club was primed to win a title, just didn't do it. So yeah. I don't think anybody's thinking about this club winning a title. They just want to get through this game and then get through little John and then get through FSU and see, see where they end up in, in, in at the end of the ACC tournament. So mm. uh, this is who they are. Uh, people just don't need to, to, to stress over the bench situation. No, I completely. Agree I think the, the Hubert's playing the best, lineups he thinks that can get them a win yeah that and- absolutely could agree more with that i mean at this point like you said it is what it is and it has worked for carolina in recent weeks in particular he's not going to play a guy that's not ready no. I mean, think of yourself as a coach anybody watching this if you're a coach of a team and if you don't have to it's not little league so they sign up and pay their 50 bucks they have to play at least one quarter you don't have to play you can put your five on the court start and leave them after the rest of the game and that's yeah. that you, and no it's, rules about it's that your your decisions are law, right? Well, mm. your objective is to win games. Mm. So if you've got a couple of guys in the bench that down the road can be really good players, but they're not there yet, you're not going to put them in. A, if they screw up, it hurts their confidence. Yeah. B, they can hurt the team. And in a game like Saturday, two or three really bad minutes could cost you in the end. Mm. Absolutely. So I don't expect to see, I don't expect to see those guys unless they've shown something in practice. And when Hubert says, okay, I think they're ready now. Yeah. And I've been given no indication that they're ready yet. Yeah, definitely. I'll, we've already hit on a little bit, but before we kind of talk about just the spectacle of the game to wrap this one up, because there's just a lot of talking points in terms of that. What does Carolina need to do to win against Duke? Because for me, I mean, I know this is kind of basic, but I, I mean, it, it bodes true for this. Carolina's five starters have to play well, because like you said, those are the guys that are going to play. You've got to get production from those guys because Carolina just doesn't have that bit of, of ability to bring guys off the bench that are going to make a big impact based on what we've seen this year. Proofs in the pudding. Um, I think Carolina's got to defend well. I mean, it goes without saying as well. Duke is a very talented offensive team. Carolina can score with the best of them. But we have seen some performances this year where Carolina has just not showed up on the defensive side of the floor. Not as much at home in recent weeks, on the road a little bit more, but that is still a concern and something Carolina's got to continue to prove. That's kind of where it starts with me. I think, obviously, play well offensively. You've got to get production from all five starters in different facets, not just points. you got to have guys playing good defense. you got to have guys getting rebounds. you got to have guys hitting shots across the board. 
And like I said, that defense has to be good as well. So what do you think is kind of the key for victory for Carolina? Well, they're going to show up. They'll be ready to play. Yeah, the question yeah. is, can they? We already hit on the defensive part, so we know what the challenges are there in keeping Duke off the offensive glass. Offensively, they need to be efficient. In the four-game winning streak, they're shooting 41.4% from the floor, but they're shooting – I got wrote the numbers down. 45.3% from three. 45.3%. So that means from two-point range, inside the circle, in the four-game win streak, they're 39.1%. So they haven't been converting the lab. They were what six for 20 on lamps against Virginia tech. I think they were eight for 24 there at night. Caleb in the last two games is four for 24 inside the arc. He's throwing up some wild, wild floaters, some awkward floaters, that kind of thing. They have to be more efficient in, in that respect. They have to shoot better, but their three point shooting has been carrying because they've been shooting like I said, it was 45.3% from yeah. three in these four in these third, four games. Third best, one of the reasons uh, they won. Third best three point shooting percentage team in the ACC as well. So, yeah, and I think they're 16th in the nation, around there, 12th in the nation, something like that. Uh, that's clearly been a strength that they haven't really had many bad outings from the perimeter. So, they have to continue that. They have to be uh, more uh, effective on their two point shots inside the circle. They got to get to the free throw line a lot, too. They, They've been making about 17 free throws a game, I think, during this win streak. And they're shooting 76% as a team. They're up almost – they're up 9.1 percentage points over last year. Last year's team, I think, was at 66.9. Get to the foul line and make free throws. You know, they can't challenge a free throw. Mark Williams can't block a free throw. Theo John can't give you a hip when you're going up to shoot a free throw like they can in the paint. So mm – -hmm. Get that thing down to Armando. Draw fouls. Armando's been shooting. He's been a little bit off here in the last few games with the wrist not being so great. But Armando's free throw shooting, by and large, is up. Mm -hmm. uh, Manic hasn't been going on the line yet, but he can hit free throws. I, you know, Caleb's been going on the line a lot. Draw fouls. You know, get whoever's going to be on him. And I think Duke's going to use a lot of different guys. Get him in foul trouble. Force Duke to have to go to the bench. You know, that could keep a team out of rhythm sometimes if they have to do that too much. Carolina can score from behind the arc. They can score at the free throw line and then be more efficient inside the circle and around the basket. Then that's a recipe for winning and obviously mm -hmm. staying fresh and the turnover situation. They've actually been pretty good lately. They haven't been turned the ball over a lot. They had that stretch where they were giving up a ton of points. I think Miami and, and uh, Wake Forest combined for 51 points off turnovers I think it was and they they were at 46 fast break points or something so you know they've got they can't allow that to creep back up if that happens Duke's going to blow them out of the gym yeah so Absolutely. there's a lot that they have to do but we've seen them do these things they just have to sort of bring it all into the same bag Saturday night and kind of unveil open it up and pour it out on the floor and let it all hang out for 40 minutes because this is a big task but I don't think Duke I don't think this is a vintage Duke team. I think it's really talented. They got a lot of nice parts and they can play at a very high level at times, but I don't think that Carolina has to be completely, totally off the charts to win this game. They just have to be very good at everything. Mm -hmm. That's a lot to ask because have we seen them play very good at everything? Yeah. NC state, they were close, at least for the first half defensively, Michigan maybe was close to that. I think they have to be better Saturday than they were against Michigan or NC state to mm -hmm. beat Duke, but I do think that this team can do that. And they need those guards to make good decisions. Don't pound it on the floor and play one on five. You know, sometimes Caleb makes his mind up before he crosses the midcourt line. Yeah, I'm taking a shot here. No matter what it comes, no <laughs> matter what they look, do, yeah. Yeah. no matter how open Brady is in the corner, I'm taking the shot. And that's part of his growth, part of his development. People would get so down on Caleb sometimes and, I understand that sometimes he makes some head scratching decisions, but people need to understand he's in his personal process. Everyone has a process and not every player is on the same track. It would be highly boring if that was the case. His track is different. He's going to, the light's going to completely go on for him at some point. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the ugly stuff that people see isn't really going to exist anymore. And he's going to be a damn good player on a consistent basis. He's still a damn good player at times. You know, he, he wasn't great the other night, still put 16 on the board. He wasn't great against NC state, still put 21 on the board. And, and, and he had some amazing assists the other night. The thing I liked about his performance against Louisville, 
and he needs to carry that that mental toughness into Saturday against Duke is he didn't let bad situations get the best of him. That's that play at the end of the half. Now he got a pep talk from Leakey, got a pep talk from Jeff Lebo. Hubert said the right things at the end of regulation going into intermission. And who hit a three pointer uh, 13 seconds into overtime mm-hmm. kind of helped get him going. It's Caleb. He, he got, he got rid of it. He got rid of the bad moment. That's a really important side of his growth. And he's still in the process of learning to do that every time. And he'll need to show that on Saturday. So, People need to have patience just because Caleb is not, has not become as consistent as people watching or listening to this podcast want him to be. Doesn't mean he's not getting better in those areas. He is getting better in those areas. He's doing it at his pace. So people need to be patient and just let it all play out. And he's going to get there at some point, likely when he's still in a Carolina uniform as well. Agreed. Agreed. Real quickly too. How big is this game for Carolina's NCAA tournament resume? Well, it's huge. And before I answer that, the spectacle is going to be off the charts. Everybody, yeah. oh, most yeah. people watching this know that you know, I've covered the league for 26 years. I've been on the, in this job straight on Carolina now. It's my eighth season in a row just on Carolina. Before that, I covered Duke hard for 13 years when I was at Star News, when I was at that national startup at Buster, and when I was at Fox Sports. Um, I covered Duke hard. I covered Coach K for 13 years. I've covered a ton of Duke games in my life. I think I understand the program pretty well. And I think I understand this rivalry pretty well. I've done in, in going back to 1997, I've done every Duke at Carolina game, except the 98 one. I didn't cover that one when Jameson went nuts and Carolina won by like 24 or something like that. I've covered the rest of them in Chapel Hill. I've done about 60 of these games. And for me personally, it's going to be really cool seeing him walk on the court with about two and a half minutes before start of the game. When he his usual time, when he comes out, the spectacle is going to be off the charts. I, I know what the rivalry is all about. People are going to yell what they yell. They're going to boo what they boo. And and hopefully it won't be like Louisville and throw stuff on the floor. Yeah, stay uh, away from that, guys. Yeah, exactly. It's going to be a cool. spectacle. It's going to be a great spectacle. It's There are moments every once in a while in this job where, you know, I may lean over to you and say, man, this is why we grind. It's cool. This is no other this is, I work 362 days a year. I'm not exactly living a life of luxury here, <laughs> but I love what I do. And part of the reward are moments like what we're going to see Saturday night. So I can't wait. I'm looking forward to it. Um, Coach K has been and Duke have been great for Carolina basketball because they've helped. They, they prop each other up. And Coach K has said this before. He talks about it more openly than Roy ever did. But he, he said often – one of the reasons those two programs are so good in the NCAA tournament is because by the time they get to the NCAA tournament, they've already played two final four games in the regular season. Cause that's what these, ma- these meetings are like. They're like final four games in some ways, the more intense because the crowd's more on top of you. And uh, for that moment, the game means everything in the world. Mm-hmm. And that's what a final four game means. So uh, they've been good for each other. And I hope, and I kind of wish Carolina was doing something, but I understand the logistics of it with people booing when they're trying to honor Coach K. Yeah, there was no way that was going to happen. It was very difficult to pull off, but yeah. people need to appreciate what he's done. I think he's helped Carolina. Carolina has to maintain that standard because Carol, as long as Carolina or Duke is doing their thing, the other, when they drop off, won't ever become Indiana. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I think that that's pretty cool. They're both going to be great for the rest of my lifetime. And, you know, my, my, my daughter who's 12 for her whole lifetime, these two programs are, they'll have down periods, but generally they're going to be great. And this game's going to matter in 30 years. Yeah. Provided there's college sports in 30 years. That's a joke because of NIL, but yeah, with everything going on. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. So, um, so I think that's cool. Uh, the other question you said. Yeah, was, just NCAA tournament resume. I mean, because Carolina up oh, yeah. until this point well, really hasn't beaten an NCAA tournament team. You know what I mean? I mean I hate well, hate they're f- they're 4-0 oh in Q2 games now, but they got to be careful because some of those wins, like the win at Louisville can end up a Q3 game if the Cardinals plummet. And after them investing so much in their last two home games, it'll be very interesting to see what they have left. Yeah, uh, looking looking ahead, and, and by the time Carolina goes to Raleigh, that could be a Q three game as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they don't have a lot of Q two opportunities left. They only have a handful of Q one right now. Clemson would be a Q one game. They moved up into number seventy three in the NET. 
Uh, but they they need to they need a Q one game, and they need to they need to be a top ten type team. The committee's going to look at Carolina, and they're going to say, okay, this club, you know, Club A and Club B, are weighing them against say a Colorado State or somebody like that, and and they're going to say, okay, well, what do they do against the best teams? Well, they got they hung with Purdue, they got routed by Tennessee, routed by Kentucky, routed by Miami routed by Wake Forest. I mean, they've got to win a game like this. They've got to win a game that shifts the national narrative so there's less pressure on the committee to not put them in. And they've got to win a game that that bumps that NET up so high that the committee doesn't even have that discussion. Mm-hmm. And, and if they don't win this game, then they have to win in Cameron. And that's going to be an enormous challenge. So th- I think this is a must win. This You win a game like this, it kind of eases some of that concern about them getting in because the ACC is so bad this year. There aren't yeah. many high value wins that are going to that are going to give you a nudge. This is the nudge game. You want to get a nudge over somebody else when your resume is being evaluated on that here in about five weeks that weekend. Mm-hmm. Uh, you got to win a game like this. If they're zero and eight or zero and nine in Q one games, and they're sitting there at twenty two and ten, they're not getting in. Yeah. So. They, they, because especially in the manner they've lost all these Q and games. So I think this is a must win game. Yeah. And, and like you said, you don't want to be put in a position where you got to go to Durham, Coach K's final game in Cameron, senior day, and, and have to, in like kind of another must win. Okay. We really got to win this game to have a chance to have a, a legitimate or, chance or, to get in the tournament. Or hope that you meet them in Brooklyn and try to beat them yeah. up there. You don't want that either now. You know, if you meet them on your playing your third game in three days with an iron five, I don't think that that's an ideal situation. So this is the best opportunity. When you the look best opportunity is you get maybe. them at home. Yeah. Get them at home. Carolina's confident. I think they're due to play well collectively. To, I think Caleb is due to have a, a cleaner, more efficient game. So all that stuff right now is probably the best time to get them. Mm-hmm. Any, uh, Prediction for this one? I think Carolina's going to win. I, I picked 80 78 in our staff picks. I just, I think Carolina's going to win this one for whatever reason. Could be a false confidence, but that's my pick with how good they've been at home and just, you know, the spectacle that it's going to be. Uh, what any prediction for this one, AJ? Well, I think that they're going to have a different, another level of edge mm-hmm. than what we've seen because that's what this game will bring out. I think that, I think Caleb's going to play really well. You know, he had four games last year as a freshman where he shot 50% from the field. He does like playing against Duke, too. (laughs) Two of them were against Duke. Now, there were there was nobody in Cameron for that game, and there were 3,000 people in the Denim. They allowed a few people at the end of the year. And I remember him saying, boy, it was great to have fans in here. Well, it's going to be all – these kids are going to be blown away. When they run out of that tunnel with 12 minutes before tip-off, when they do that final, you know – layup line stuff, they're going to be blown away by what they experience. And I think that if they're not overwhelmed by it, it will lift them up mm. and it'll, it'll make them better. They'll, they'll have that little extra edge that you need in a game like this. I think they'll have that. I think Caleb will play really, really well. And I think Armando will have some success as well. And, and either Manic or RJ, they need another guy to kind of have one of those big shooting games in the perimeter to win. And I think they're going to get that. And I think Puff Johnson's going to do something off the bench, you know, get a couple of loose balls, turn one into a bucket, maybe hit a three off a ghost screen or something and give them an edge during a part of the game where they really need it. And I think the Tar Heels are going to win this game yeah. in the 87, 82 kind of range. I think it's going to be pretty high scoring. I do too. Yeah. It's, you know, prime opportunity. I mean, Carolina wins on Saturday, you know, you play them final game in, in, in Cameron, which is going to be tough. What is that? You know, Carolina could go out saying they beat K in three of his last four Carolina Duke rivalry games. So that's some bragging rights as well that I know you would see. Well, they won four out of th- they won four out of seven, I think. Yeah. Good. Duke was down last year. Carolina yeah, they were. was down the year before. Kind of, you know, kind of weird that, that both teams of each programs had a bad year uh, the last two years, one, two years ago, the only last year or so. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is more of a, a little bit more of a typical Duke Carolina type thing, although Carolina, because Carolina's trending in the right direction. So I think we'll see, I think we'll see a lot of good things from the Tar Heels on Saturday. And uh, I think they're going to get a win. And if this game was in Durham right now, I think they get, uh, Duke would wipe the floor with them. But, I think uh, so too. but it's not in Cameron, it's in Chapel Hill. Yeah. A lot of stuff pointing in the right direction for Carolina going in this game, in my opinion. 
Yeah, couldn't agree more, AJ. Big game coming up on Saturday. I mean, it's Carolina Duke. So many other storylines we'll be covering also going into it and during it and after it. So make sure you guys keep it locked to TarHillIllustrated.com for all your coverage leading up to the game, all your in-game coverage. And come sign up. Just 833 a month to be a premium subscriber. Our message boards have been absolutely on fire. They've been great over this basketball season and football season as well. It's been fantastic. Live game chats, a great time to get involved with those. If you're a premium subscriber, you can – follow along on our live game chats, get involved with that. A lot of our subscribers are just, you know, so knowledgeable about the game and so fun to interact with and talk to, especially during the game. So if you want to sign up, link to our website is in the description below. You'll see it pop up very quickly. Just 833 a month. Like I said, fantastic time to do so. If you want a little bit of extra content that you can't get, if you're not signed up. So good place to wrap this one up. Me and AJ will be in the Smith center um, on Saturday. Who's shooting the game? Is it is Kevin going to be there? Jenna. Jenna. Jenna is shooting. Jenna will be there as well. Oh, no, 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 no. Kevin. It is yeah, Kevin. Jenna is shooting the game at Duke. I just did my request uh, gotcha, for that. Gotcha, so gotcha. that's right. I got Kevin shooting Saturday at home. Jenna will shoot the game at Cameron. Awesome. So we'll have three of us in there. If you're going to be a fun one, always, always such a fun game and an awesome game. And, so mm-hmm. I, I think we're in section one. I know that Steve said that if there's national radio there, we might get bumped upstairs. But come if you want to come say hi, come check us yeah. out in section 110. We're yeah. in that little booth at section 110. Yeah, come check us out. Come say what's up to us. Love to interact with our subscribers. We've had more of that over this year, especially get people just coming up to us before football games, before basketball games as well, just, just saying, hey, and how much they appreciate what we do, which obviously means a lot to us. So check us out, TarHillIllustrate.com. Like I said, sign up for just 833 a month. Make sure you check out Rogue Apothecary as well. Link in the description below. Use the promo code TARHEELS10 to save and you guys know the drill make sure you like share subscribe hit that notification bell and let's do this this time if you think carolina is going to win this game if you're feeling good about it going into saturday go ahead and give this video a thumbs up below go ahead and like it make sure you share with all your friends as well as we are getting very very close to hitting that ten thousand subscribers mark we're trying to hit that before the end of basketball season i think we're on course to do that so keep spreading it if you enjoy our content we always appreciate everybody that tunes in and watches us and obviously is is a subscriber and checks out checks out our work on TarHillIllustrated.com as well. Thanks for watching, guys. We'll see you in the next one. Thanks.